It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, speaker, 2.4 million Ontarians don't have a family doctor right now. People in small and rural communities are traveling just enormous distances to find uh, their emergency rooms closed. More and more patients are being forced to turn to for-profit clinics where they're being asked to pay up for extra charges and fees. Speaker, with this in mind, and my question is to the Premier, why is the government choosing to spend hundreds of millions of dollars to get out of a beer store contract that would have expired in a year anyway? The member for Oakville and parliamentary assistant to the Minister of Finance. Well, thank you, Speaker. And uh, that's, that's, Speaker, that's simply liberal NDP math. And I do. I might add, I, I, with that as well, I'd like to thank the Minister of Education for bringing financial literacy to our high schools, Maybe because clearly the members opposite could, could take some lessons from there. <laughs> Speaker, the government of Ontario is ending a 97-year monopoly, furthered by a 10-year horrible deal that was signed by the previous Liberal government. Our government is bringing in convenience and competition. That's what we ran on. That's what the people have elected, Speaker, and that's what the people of Ontario want. Yeah. And you know what, Speaker? I'm willing to bet when the cameras are off, the cameras are away, the members opposite will be in a convenience Order. store on a Friday night picking up a bottle of wine after a rough week at Queen's Park. <laughs> The supplementary question. I mean, I think, uh, I mean, this is what we're talking about here are facts, and in fact, it's the government's own numbers. The government themselves have admitted that it's going to cost at least $225 million to break this contract early, but we all know on this side that the true cost could be so much higher. When you factor in the lost revenue to the LCBO or other associated costs of this deal, we're hearing it could reach as much as a billion dollars a billion dollars just to get out of a contract that would have expired anyway. People are shaking their heads at this terrible deal, Speaker. Is this costly contract exit just another one of the Premier's vanity projects that everybody else in this province is going to be left paying for? Thank you. And again, Speaker, I don't know who this, uh, where this math is coming from, but it's probably the same people that signed the green energy deal, which was uh, one of the worst deals ever uh, recorded in the history of Ontario, and the same people that brought that 10-year deal that was a horrible deal, which rose taxes and, and obviously did away with convenience. So, Speaker, our government is providing choice and convenience, and we're doing it, and we're helping smooth the transition for workers through a difficult period. Clearly, we understand here on this side why workers en masse are coming over to support the Progressive Conservatives. We are bringing in legislation that is supportive of workers. The members opposite are clearly not Order. supportive of workers because they don't want to help workers through this transition. Order. Why are we proceeding with this? Number one, economic growth. This is going to create 7,500 jobs right here in the province of Ontario, $200 million in GDP. Second, it's helping convenience Response. and competition, something the opposition against. And third, we are supporting small businesses, the backbone of our province here in Ontario. Speaker, government wants to talk bad deals. Let's talk about a 99-year deal with 407. Or how about a 95-year deal for a luxury spa? I mean, come on, give me a break. People in Ontario are putting off all kinds of things right now because their bank accounts are being stretched to the limit. They're making very careful choices every day. And you know what? They expect their government to do the same with the public purse. one vanity project after another, license plates you can't read, partisan promo ads, yeah. and it is the people of Ontario who always pay the price. So to the Premier, people in this province are facing real issues. Will the Premier start focusing on them instead of his own personal projects? <laughs> The Premier. 
Well, Mr. Mr. Speaker, this goes back to your mentioning about the uh, beer and wine in the corner stores ready to drink. I agree with my colleagues. Each and every one of you, why don't you give us your word? You'll never show up to a convenience store. You'll never show up to a retail store. Never going to happen. Never ever going to happen. But Mr. Speaker, this is this is a comparison to the NDP and Bonnie Crombie and the Liberals want to increase taxes. They're all right with the monopoly. They're all right with three international companies controlling the market for 97 years. This is about convenience for the people. This is about creating another 800 to a billion dollars of economic development. 7,500 jobs just in the convenience, not mentioning the retail. Isn't it amazing? Everyone from the wine growers to the wine producers, the beer producers, they're all for it. The only people who aren't for it are the NDP and the I remind the members to make their comments through the chair. The member for Ottawa South will come to order. The next question, the Leader of the Opposition. Billion dollars to get out of a deal that was going to expire in a year? Something doesn't smell right about this. We know it. The people of Ontario know it. We're not going to stop fighting to find out more. This smells just like the Green Belt. And I want to tell you, Speaker, this is why it matters. Every few days, we hear yet another unplanned closure of an emergency room or a critical hospital department. Last year, there were more than 1,000 emergency room and urgent care closures in the province of Ontario. That means families facing emergencies drove to their local hospital and found the doors were closed. Euron Bruce declared a state of emergency. While they are experiencing ongoing and simultaneous closures, Speaker, while they're being told they will lose even more beds, what does this government have to say to Ontarians scared about losing their emergency rooms? And to respond, the Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. No, Speaker. These are not issues that started overnight, and these are not issues that are going to be solved overnight. Having said that, I am very proud of the investments that our government has made, whether it is in 50 hospital capital builds, new, expanded, that are happening now under the Premier's watch. When we see the Canadian Residency Matching Service, which matches residents new medical students who want to practice in their specialty. For the second year in a row, historically, we have matched 100 per cent in the province of Ontario. Oh, wow. Never before happened until the last two years. We're expanding medical school seats. We want to make sure that communities have access to primary care, which is why we have expanded 78 new primary Response. care multidisciplinary teams. We're getting the work done in, frankly, decades of neglect from the previous governments. Thank you. Over a thousand emergency rooms closed last year. That is nothing to be proud of. Six years in, this is this government's record. While local hospitals are begging this government for funding to keep their doors open and help them retain staff. The government is far more focused on cutting deals for this premier's vanity projects than that, that is going to cost Ontarians a billion dollars. Instead of dedicating funding to keep emergency rooms open, the government is spending millions and millions to break a contract with LCBO and beer stores just one year early. So my question, Speaker, to the Premier again is why is this government more focused on cutting a deal than getting health care for Ontarians? Members, will please take their seats. Minister of Health. You know, I, I have to compare and contrast. We've talked about the expansions that we are doing in our health care system. And I look at what the Liberal government did, where they actually cut 50 residency spaces in the province of Ontario. What does that mean, Speaker? That means for every year that they were in power, there was 50 fewer medical students who were able to practice and train in the province of Ontario. And yes, that does have an impact now. When I think of the um, unfortunate Bob Ray days, where we had nurses literally graduating in Ontario and going to the States. And Speaker, many of those nurses didn't come back. We need to have a system that ensures that 
as we train, as we give opportunities, we are going to make sure that those opportunities are happening here in Ontario. 2,400 new physicians who were given a license to practice Response. in the province of Ontario last year. And, Speaker, almost half of those were internationally educated and trained physicians who want to be in Ontario. Thank you. Thank you. Final supplementary. I don't, I don't really know what this Premier doesn't get about the question. Like, People in the province of Ontario are struggling right now. Yep. Right? They are making choices every day to put off spending decisions because they are, they are in so much pain, Order. because they can't keep up with their bills, because they're worried they're going to lose the, the roof Order. over their heads. That's where people are in the province of Ontario six years after this government was elected. Hospital rooms closed. Emergency rooms closed. 2.4 million Ontarians without a family physician. How many times does a parent have to show up at a closed Order. emergency room with a sick kid before this government starts to put their needs ahead of this government and this Premier's vanity projects? Members will please take their seats. The Premier. The goal. The goal. The Leader of the Opposition saying about affordability. They voted against the 10.7 cent reduction in gas. They voted against uh, getting rid of the tolls on the 412 and, and 4, 418. They voted about getting rid of the sticker that cost people hundreds of dollars every single month. They voted against the one fare, get, making sure people could have. Premier, please take your seat. There's too much noise. Most of it's coming from the government side at the moment. The Premier has the floor. I want to hear him. Premier. <laughs> they voted against any tax cuts. They voted against the reduction of hydro rates here. But let's remember, when they were in power along with the Liberals, they destroyed this province, chased 300,000 jobs out of the province, while there's 700,000 more people working today. That <laughs> The next question, the order. The next question, the member for Hamilton Mountain. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. On May 14th, a tragedy which no parent should ever have to face happened at a Trenton public high school. A six-year-old student with special needs who was vulnerable and had Gervais syndrome was left unattended in a sensory room, ugh, unsupervised for hours. An amazing young person filled with love, light, and kindness. Gervais syndrome is a rare genetic form of epilepsy, which meant he was prone to seizures, typically while asleep. Landon Ferris fell asleep, later to be found unresponsive, exactly the reason why he was not supposed to be left alone. This is a heartbreaking story that many families fear of underfunding and understaffing in our public education institutions. Premier, what steps will your government take so that what happened to Landon never happens again? The Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, the loss of a child is an unspeakable tragedy, and I think. Um, I speak for all parliamentarians in expressing our deepest condolences to the family and friends of the Trenton High School and to this young man who passed away, the, to the entire Hastings and Prince Edward District School Board community. I know, Mr. Speaker, that the corner of Ontario and the school board have launched an investigation into this incident, into this tragedy, and I know all parties will work together to ensure this tragedy does not happen again. Supplementary question. Thank you. Landon's parents are living every parent's worst nightmare. Every child should come home safely at the end of a school day. We don't need to wait for the results of an investigation into Landon's death to make sure that all children are safe at school. Parents of kids with special needs have been warning for years that underfunding and shortage of resources was putting their kids at risk. This nearly uh, this year, nearly two-thirds of principals in Ontario have had to ask parents to keep their children with special needs home because they can't keep them safe at school. Will the Premier commit today to the necessary investments in special education and to ensure that we have enough caring, qualified adults necessary to keep kids safe in Ontario schools? 
Members will please take their seats. The Minister of Education. Thank you, Speaker. I recognize that the Corner of Ontario has launched an investigation. I'd encourage all members to respect that process. But having said that, more broadly, I can affirm to the House that the government has increased supports in mental health and special education. In mental health, our funding is now up over 550 per cent from 2018. We've annualized services for children who need them through the summers. We've increased special education funding, and this year funding is up uh, roughly $117 million more than last year, with 3,500 additional EAs hired. I know there's more work to do, and I look forward to doing it together. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. The next question, the member for Thornhill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. My question is for the Minister of Energy. Uh, the inflation and affordability concerns Ontarians are facing right now are a direct result of the federal carbon tax. Individuals and families are paying higher taxes and higher costs for the necessities of life, like food, gas and housing. Speaker, the carbon tax is not working. It's adding more financial pressure for Ontarians, and there is no environmental gain. But the carbon tax Queen Bonnie Crombie and her Liberal caucus are supporting their federal bodies and a failed tax policy that has been proven not to work. Speaker, can the minister please tell the House how our government is keeping costs down for the people as well as uh, all, uh, all of the uh, and suffer from the Liberals' incompetent and insensitive economic management? Juan, the Minister of Energy. Well, Speaker, we are keeping costs down in spite of the costly federal carbon tax supported by the Queen of the Carbon Tax, Bonnie Crombie, the price of gasoline, the price of groceries, the price of home heating, all going up thanks to Justin Trudeau and Bonnie Crombie's tax supported by the NDP as well. Now, we've taken a different pathway here in Ontario. We've reduced costs like the 10.7 cents a litre at the pumps, Mr. Speaker. Uh, one fare for transit riders in Ontario, saving them $1,600 a year, Mr. Speaker. Uh, making sure we've eliminated the license plate sticker fees and other taxes and fees to drive down the costs of living and ensure that we're seeing the type of growth that we're seeing in Ontario, at the same time ensuring that we have the power that we need with a plan called Powering Ontario's Growth to ensure that we continue to see the multi-billion dollar investments that we have been seeing right Response. across our province, Mr. Speaker. You can do this, and it doesn't require a punitive carbon tax. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the minister for his response and the great work he does within his ministry. So, the people in my riding of, of Thornhill and across this province want an end to the Liberal carbon tax. They feel the impact every time they're at the gas pumps buying groceries or paying their heating bills. Speaker, Ontarians are looking for relief, not more tax hikes. While our government, under the leadership of our Premier, has spoken out against the tax since day one, the NDP and the Liberals have not done the same. We know that the carbon tax makes life more difficult and is unfair to all Ontarians. That's why we won't give up our, uh, give up our fight until this tax is abolished. Speaker, can the minister please explain how the carbon tax unfairly impacts the people of Ontario? Mr. Energy. Uh, speaker, it's pretty clear because it's impacting everything that we purchase day in, day out, at the grocery store, at the pumps, on our home heating bills, Mr. Speaker. It's costing the people of Ontario more, yet we have done everything we can to ensure we're combating that increased carbon tax and ensuring that we have the low-cost power that we need so we continue to see these multi-billion dollar investments in our province, Mr. Speaker. Our economy is humming in Ontario. As the late Bob Cole would say, oh, baby, we are seeing investments right across Ontario in the electric vehicle and the EV battery sector. We're looking like Connor McDavid busting down the wing and breaking toward the goal, moving the Edmonton Oilers onto the Stanley Cup final for the first time in many, many years, Mr. Speaker. Let's all get together. Let's support a Canadian team in the Stanley Cup finals, and let's support getting rid of this carbon tax in Ottawa. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Kiwetnaw. Speaker, um, the Dryden paper mill continues to harm the waters and the rivers and grassy narrows First Nation. Since the release of the report on high mercury levels, 
in the English and the Wabagoon rivers last week. No one from this government, including the minister, has been in touch with Chief Turtle about the study. Speaker, uh, how many more studies should Grassy Narrows release before Ontario does anything about cleaning up the river? Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Our government will continue to take action to correct a historic wrong and will continue to work with the Indigenous community towards remediation of this historic site when it comes to remediating the murky, mercury contamination. As the member knows, and I spoke about it last, uh, last week, Ministry of Technical Experts met with Dr. Fireburn and the Indigenous communities to review the reports as part of their work on the panel's technical subcommittee. Uh, this was uh, with, along with representatives from the ministry, representatives from Grassineros, as well as First Nations, uh, Wegamong Independent Nation, Eagle Lake First Nation, Wegagoon Lake uh, Ojibwe Nation, our participants in these discussions. Dr. Fireburn also confirmed additional work is still needed to finalize a report, including field uh, sampling. Speaker, let me be clear, remediation efforts for the English and Wegagoon rivers will be guided by science and by the best technical expertise. Contamination in the English and Wagoon rivers Response. is a complex issue, but let me be clear, we can remain to be committed to solve this, and our government takes this very serious, and our first order of business has always been to correct historic wrong, and we'll continue to do that. Here, here. The supplementary question, the member for from West, Ancaster Dundas. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, that was a disappointing answer. The minister's answer should have been to order the immediate cleanup of the Wabagoon River and stop the ongoing mercury poisoning of Grassy Narrows First Nation. A recent study confirmed that the mercury poisoning is worse than was thought, twice as bad, in fact. This is a human and ecological disaster and it has been going on for generations. So for heaven's sakes, Speaker, the time for studies has well passed. Last week, you, the minister, committed to immediate action, so my question, uh, why didn't that immediate action include you, Minister, uh, visiting directly Grassy First, Na Grassy Nails First Nations so that you could see the devastating impact that this ongoing tragedy is having on the people that live there? And the members make the comments to the chair. Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Uh, speaker, the uh, report that the member is referring to, in part, it was funded and commissioned by this government in partnership with the communities and the First Nations communities because, again, this government takes this matter very seriously. Our first order of business when we first got elected in 2018, not today but back in 2018, was to correct historic wrong and to take the immediate actions <laughs> necessary. As I already spoke about this, the scientific and expertise work that's being done at the table, Order. that's not the only thing we've just done. There's always additional work that is underway to really understand the extent and location of contamination in this river and systems. This is something that was asked for, and that is why this study is in place, to know the extent of the 250 kilometers downstream and what the, what the impacts are on the historic contamination in Dryden. Speaker, this panel, as I mentioned, is funded uh, in part with our government as a project. There's a project team um, that is, is, is doing the proper science. We're taking the politics out Response. of this, referring to the science because this government remains committed to correcting this historic wrong. Here, here. Thank you. The next question, the member for Brantford Brant. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Mines. Speaker, in my riding of Brantford Brant and across the province, families are feeling significant financial pressures due to the federal carbon tax. It is clear that the Liberal and NDP members in this House do not care how this costly tax impacts everyone in Ontario, especially in the North. Speaker, they are shamefully choosing to ignore the concerns of people in their own ridings. In contrast, our government is leaving no stone unturned to make life more affordable and to help keep costs down. But, Speaker, we cannot do it alone. The federal Liberals need to step up and do the right thing. Abolish the tax. Speaker, can the minister please tell this House why all members of the legislature must, must push back against the federal carbon tax? Thank you. Minister of Mines. Thank you for the question from the, our great 
parliamentary colleague here from Brantford Brant. He's doing a tremendous job. <laughs> Speaker, this tax proves that they do not care about the people of the North who heat their homes with oil or propane while, they're living, while they make a living mining minerals to keep this province flourishing. It's time to learn from your colleagues in North Nova Scotia who across all parties passed a unanimous motion in the legislature calling on the federal counter counterparts to vote against the carbon tax hike. It's disgrace disgraceful that the opposition and liberals in this house do not have the same priorities as their Atlantic colleagues. And make no mistake, mistake it, Speaker, this Justin Trudeau tax on everything, supported by the Liberals and NDP members in this House, make it tougher for mining Response. companies to operate. Mining companies in Ontario have had enough. Tell your friends in Ottawa to scrap this tax. Scrap it. Supplementary. No, thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for that response. It is shameful that the Liberals and the NDP continue to disregard Ontarians' concerns over the carbon tax. They are not here for the people. Instead, they are supporting a future of more punitive taxes. Speaker, life is already expensive Order. for the hardworking individuals and families across our entire province. The very last thing they need to worry about is paying an ever-increasing Liberal carbon tax. Our government will continue to call for an end to this regressive vanity tax, attract more investments for our businesses, and keep costs down for Ontarians because we know that a better future is not created by hiking taxes. Since the opposition is unable to understand this simple concept, Speaker, can the minister please explain why the carbon tax hinders Ontario's ability to grow? Thank you. The Minister of Mines. Speaker, thank you again for the member for the question. The mining industry is driving a major economic shift to EVs, the likes of which have not, we have not seen since the oil boom at the turn of the last century. BNN reported that the world is going to need mine five, to mine five times more copper than we have ever mined in history in the next 30 years and 20 more times nickel. This will be a monumental effort but it also will, is a generational opportunity to reshape our economy and create thousands of new jobs for the next generation. Yet the Liberals and the NDP seem to be actively chasing away companies and major investments with the terrible taxes and tone-deaf statements like, we don't need more roads. Mm -hmm. Well, Speaker, I've got news for them. Continuing down this road, and you will destroy not only the jobs and opportunities today, but also the Spons. hopes and dreams of the next generation. It's long past for the NDP and Liberals in this House to stand with us and tell their buddies in Ottawa to stop taxing the people into poverty and chasing away life-changing business opportunities. Thank you. The next question, the member for Ottawa West. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Today, the Algonquin College Board of Governors is considering a motion to suspend the hairstyling and aesthetics programs for financial reasons. These programs graduate skilled trades workers, mostly women. The hairstyling program is so successful that it has a wait list of 57 people, enough to open a second class. It is an affordable program that gives students a path to a stable career with a good income. That includes Indigenous students who choose Algonquin College because it welcomes their culture. Speaker, this program is a success story that is in jeopardy today because of the lack of financial support for post-secondary institutions in Ontario. The member for Ottawa Centre and I wrote to the Minister of Colleges and Universities last Friday asking for more funding to save this program. Will she deliver that today? The Minister of Colleges and Universities. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for that question. And I want to remind the member that uh, post-secondary institutions are autonomous institutions and make the decisions on programs uh, for their, their own uh, schools themselves. But I think what the member and I do both agree on is the importance of women in trades. And whether you are in hairstyling or you're a construction worker, you're a valued member of a, a skilled trade. Okay. 
I was recently in Indiana with the um, Minister of uh, Small Business and the Minister of Agriculture, and I had the opportunity to be part of a roundtable in workforce development where I spoke about the importance of women in trades and some of the great programs that are happening here at Ontario's colleges. And thank you to Conestoga College for creating the Jill of All Trades programs, which works directly with high school and elementary students to ensure that we're getting more women into the trades. So we'll continue to work with the response. School. I think I agree. We value the importance of skilled trade workers, and uh, we'll be continue to work with the school. Supplementary question, member for Ottawa Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, back to the minister. I appreciate the agreement in this house on women in the trades, but we need a little less money to end bad contracts for beer, and we little, little, need a little bit more money in the college system to make sure that a program as successful as this one continues. This program, the Hairstyling and Aesthetics program, is so popular, Speaker, that in the last two weeks, when the program found out abruptly their program would be suspended, they have a petition of over 5,000 signatures. There are students in this program and businesses affiliated to this program, Speaker, literally, I tell this house sincerely, that cut the Prime Minister of Canada's hair, that cut the federal leader of the opposition's hair, that are active in our community. This is a success story, and if we floor more money from Queen's Park, we can save this program. So again. Plaintive appeal to the minister, because I know she cares about skilled trades and women's in the trades. Can we commit today to Algonquin College that money will flow to save this program? Yes or no? Minister Colleges and Universities. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to, to both members for your questions and your concern about the, the uh, college in your area. I want to assure the members that conversations are still ongoing, and I commit to updating you on any further conversations or further information that we have on the program and our conversations with Algonquin College. But as I spoke about the importance of trades and filling the gaps across this province in all area of trades, I want to thank the Minister of Education for his work. Starting this fall, every student coming to grade nine will complete two mandatory tech ed programs. This will ensure that young women are having the opportunity to use their hands in school to, to look at the trades and the work that is continuing to be done through my ministry and the Ministry of Labour as well. We want to ensure that there's more opportunities for young women to enter the trades because we can admit we need trades workers in every area of this province, in all different areas. We will continue to work with our amazing Response. colleagues in Ontario to ensure that we have the skilled trade workers for the, the future. Thank you. The next question, the member for Ottawa South. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Speaker, the provincial debt is higher than it's ever been, almost $100 million in five years. We have historic deficits. Government spending? Well, by all accounts, it's out of control. Even the Premier's office budget has more than doubled in five years. Wow. That gravy train? Well, it just keeps on rolling. Meanwhile, the services that Ontario families depend on, well, they're failing. Yet, it's this Premier's newest priority to spend a billion dollars to get beer and wine in corner stores a little more than a year earlier than planned. So I'm not exactly sure what planet the Premier thinks Order. that this would all be okay on. So maybe the Premier could explain to us, Speaker, through you, who exactly benefits from his billion-dollar boost dog. Premier? Oh, Mr. Speaker, let's put this into context. When we came down here, we walked into a bankrupt uh, company. That's what I call it. 300,000 jobs were lost. Taxes went up Order. to the roof. And, uh, uh, you know, increased the, the debt by $100 billion alone. What we've done something that no other government's ever done that I could ever remember, federally, provincially, municipally. We increased revenue $64 billion, but we've never raised the tax. We've never raised the tax on the backs of people. We've reduced the burden of tax on the backs of people. We've reduced the cost of doing business by $8 billion each and every single year. We've created the environment for 700,000 new uh, people to be employed. We've seen $43 billion of investment in the EV sector, $20 billion in the tech sector, $3 billion in the life science sector. Response. We created more jobs than all 50 U.S. states combined last year. That's what we've done. The supplementary question. I'm trying to figure out why the Premier is so hot and heavy to get booze at the quickie a year early. So the only, figure, the only thing I can figure out is it's going to make his billion-dollar buddies so much happier. Meanwhile, 2.3 million Ontarians, they don't have a family doctor. And that number, it keeps going up. Emergency rooms are closing. Rural hospitals are closing down. Seniors are waiting and not getting the care they need to live in their own home. And every day, 
every day, Speaker, more and more Ontario families are having to use their credit card instead of their OHIP card to access basic Order. care that they need. Order. So, Speaker, I know the other side doesn't like it, but maybe more. the Premier can explain why booze is such a high priority for him and not the health care that Ontario families need. Premier. You know, Mr. Speaker, I ran a business for over 30 years. I get it. I've never seen a worse contract against the people of Ontario than what the Liberals signed with, with the big three beer stores. It was a monopoly. They took advantage of it. They're okay with raising taxes. They're okay with raising taxes, Mr. Speaker. They don't mind that. I've never seen a Liberal government ever since I've been alive that doesn't believe in one thing. Tax the people to death, tax businesses to death until they leave the province. We don't believe in taxation. We believe in growth through new revenues, new opportunities, more jobs. That's what we believe in, Mr. Speaker. We will never raise the tax on the backs of the people, unlike you. Restart the clock. The next question, the member for Markham Union. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy. At a time when affordability is already top of mind for many Ontarians, the Liberal carbon tax is continuing to drive costs up, up, and up. And not just energy costs, Speaker. The costs for food, housing, and much more are all being pushed up by higher by this terrible tax. That's why, Speaker, it should be a given that all members in this legislature oppose this tax. Unfortunately, that's not the case. Rather than joining our government in calling for an end to the carbon tax, the NDP and the Liberals want to see this tax tripled by 2030. Speaker, would the minister please explain what steps our government is taking to support our clean energy future without resorting our carbon tax. Minister of Energy. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks to the member from uh, Markham Unionville for the question this morning. There's no question about it that the carbon tax is impacting the cost of anything that gets delivered. Anything that comes from our farmers is going up in price. So groceries, household goods, uh, the price at the pumps, obviously, home heating, it's all going up. It's all making life more expensive. So it's unreal to hear this phony outrage that comes from the opposition parties or a phony concern when it comes to the cost of living crisis when they support this punitive carbon tax that's coming from Justin Trudeau and the queen of the carbon tax, Bonnie Crombie. Madam Speaker, we have a plan called Powering Ontario's Growth. It's a plan that's ensuring we continue to grow the economy like the Premier was just talking about. Multi-billion dollar investments from Windsor all the way to Ottawa and north into Sault Ste. Marie and far beyond as we develop the Ring of Fire, Madam Speaker. There's so much happening in Ontario, we don't need this punitive carbon tax. Supplementary recognize the member from Markham Unionville. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that response. We hear it from time and time again. The Liberal carbon tax only hurts Ontario families. As people in our province continue to struggle with high interest rates and rising costs of living, all governments should be putting forward measures that provide financial relief for individuals and families. Instead, the federal Liberals, supported by their provincial counterparts, are choosing to drive up the prices of day-to-day -day essentials like gas in tank and groceries. Speaker, Ontarians have had enough. They want to see this tax scrapped. Speaker, could the minister please explain to the House why this federal government must end the tax, must end the carbon tax today? Thank you. Response, I recognize the Minister of Energy. Speaker, uh, the Markham uh, Union Bill member is right again. Uh, the cost of this tax is already making life more affordable for unaffordable for the people of uh, 
Ontario and unaffordable for the people right across our country, Madam Speaker. And that's why we've taken a different route, bringing in one fare so transit riders can save up to $1,600 a year, cutting the price at the pumps by 10.7 cents a litre on the Ontario gas tax, making sure we're eliminating the license plate sticker fees, and so much more. Now, we also have this plan called Powering Ontario's Growth, which is ensuring that we're getting competitive investment in new generation in our province, unlike what the Liberals did previously with the very costly punitive Green Energy Act. It drove up the price of energy in our province, Spons. making 300,000 manufacturing jobs leave for other jurisdictions. We're not doing that. We're lowering taxes. As a result, we've seen jobs roar back into Ontario, 700,000 new jobs. Let's scrap this tax today. Thank you, Speaker. The Eglinton Crosstown was supposed to be completed by 2021. It's now 2024. This project has no end date in sight and is costing Ontario taxpayers billions of dollars in cost overruns. Will the government tell us when the Eglinton Crosstown will finally be open for service or just admit that they have no idea when and how much more we have to pay? Response and recognize the Minister of Transportation. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker, and to the member for that question. We're embarking upon the largest expansion in public transit uh, in, the in all of uh, North America, uh, Mr. Speaker, and we'll continue to do so. Uh, the Eglinton Crosstown project, we're all frustrated by it, but we know that con construction is complete on it, and we are now in, in testing mode, Mr. Speaker. If it was up to the NDP, they wouldn't want any of these projects uh, to be built. They've actually voted against the Crosstown West extension. They voted against the Ontario lawn. They don't support our investments in public transit, where we've brought forward measures on affordability, $1,600 uh, saved by transit users each year in the GTA and across. We're going to continue to invest in public transit. We're going to continue to build and get shovels in the ground, like the Ontario line and the Scarborough subway extension. This supplementary question. Speaker, through you, I'd like to remind the minister that budget bills are confidence votes, and there's one thing we don't have confidence in, is this government. But, Speaker, it's impossible to get real answers on the Eglinton Crosstown. That's because this government and its transit agency is actually spending thousands and thousands of dollars on lawyers to hide information from the public. Will the government finally come clean and tell us just what they are hiding and how much the costs have ballooned under their mismanagement? Mr. Transportation. Mr. Speaker, let's talk about the confidence the people of this province have in this government. Throw back to the by-elections, Mr. Speaker. Two by-election oh, victories in Milton yeah. and in London. Because the people of this province believe in the vision that the Premier has, including the two-way all-day go and over $6 billion that we're going to invest into Milton to provide that community with Yikes. more transit and public transit, Mr. Tommy, Speaker. Let's point. talk about those opportunities that the NDP have had to support important projects like the Eglinton West Crosstown extension that's going to put over 26,000 people within walking distance of public transit. Wow. The Ontario Line, 40,000 people every single day. And these members, the NDP, are voting against that, not supporting oh, that Tom. by the Liberals as well, Tommy, Mr. Speaker, Tommy, for 15 Tommy. years. They did absolutely nothing to build transit in this province. They voted against every one of our measures as we support public transit in this province. Bonds. Under the leadership of Premier Ford, Griffin, we are embarking Griffin. upon the largest expansion of public transit in all of North The next question, the member for Storma, Dundas, South Glengarry. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Indigenous Affairs and Northern Development. The Liberal carbon tax is exasperating the financial pressures many people in Ontario are currently facing, and I hear it every day in my ride in Stormont, Dundas, and South Glengarry. During a time of rising cost of living and high interest rates, the federal Liberals have decided to hike the carbon tax by another 23 wow. per cent. Speaker, this punitive tax is making everything more expensive for everyone in Ontario, especially in the north, like cities like Thunder Bay. While carbon tax queen Bonnie Crombie and her minivan caucus continue to work against us, we will not let that deter us from getting it done for the people of Ontario. It is time to scrap the tar carbon tax now. Speaker, can the minister please explain why the people of Ontario cannot afford this Liberal tax grab? 
Minister of Northern Development, Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member for Stormont Dundas, South Glen Gary. He's an outstanding member of provincial parliament. He's doing a great job as the parliamentary assistant. And it's his birthday today. Unfortunately, Mr. Speaker, I don't have I don't have the present that he's looking for, and that's a pause on the carbon tax. Now, the official opposition in Ottawa finally caught on to the concept, since that's what we've been doing now for a year or two, Mr. Speaker, giving people relief at the pumps, Mr. Speaker, giving Northerners relief as we ship expensive cargo into the isolated and remote communities. I was in Sault Ste. Marie up to Wawa uh, last week, Mr. Speaker, and all I heard were people talking about how much more expensive it is to live, Mr. Speaker. As people try to build uh, new buildings in, in uh, uh, various communities along that beautiful stretch Response. of highway, Mr. Speaker, it was one thing. It was the cost and the tax, that, the impact it's having on it, Mr. Speaker. The message is clear. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that response. It's not fair that families and businesses in northern communities are disproportionately impacted by the federal carbon tax. It's also not fair that, instead of supporting northern Ontario, the opposition are choosing to sit in their seats and do absolutely nothing. Speaker, ignoring the detrimental effects that the carbon tax has on northern Ontario is disrespectful to every person living in the north. The NDP and Liberals need to do better. Speaker. They should join our government in calling on the federal government to eliminate this tax and put more money back in the people's pockets. Speaker, can the minister tell the House what the people of Ontario have to say about this regressive and unnecessary tax? Mr. Northern Government, Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Reporter, Mr. Speaker, I've tried my best to chronicle the carbon tax times here, and I've noticed, Mr. Speaker, that in an effort to ennoble the, ennoble the carbon tax, Mr. Speaker, the king of the carbon tax and the queen of the carbon tax, uh, Bonnie Crombie, have been trying desperately to make this cogent argument that a consumer carbon tax is the single only uh, ta environmental tax that you could have out there. Now, as time has worn on, Mr. Speaker, uh, it seems like there might be a different way to do it, Mr. Speaker. And now we're seeing a complete ablution from all of the folks that used to support the carbon tax. So the Mark Carneys, the the Jagmeet Singhs, Mr. Speaker, gone. They've washed their hands of this expensive tax because they know consumers are paying more, Mr. Response. Speaker, and they can't afford it, and neither can Northerners. They're no exception, Mr. Speaker. They have one message. Scrap the tax. The next question, the member for Niagara Falls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Just a few weeks ago, this government turned their backs on 3.3 million Ontario caregivers by saying no to a benefit for unpaid caregivers in the province of Ontario. Over the last few weeks, thousands of people in Niagara have contacted me and came to our office to sign a petition and say we need a caregiver benefit. At the ALS and the Crohn's fundraising walks this weekend, I heard loud and clear that we need a caregiver benefit. My question is to the Premier. Will you listen to the 3.3 million caregivers in Ontario and the people of Niagara and support a caregiver's benefit today? And you please take your seats. The Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. There is absolutely no doubt that we rely on and we include caregivers in all of our decisions when we are enhancing and improving the health care system here in Ontario. You know, I think of my own family where we had people who were prepared to be part of a health care solution, working with clinicians, working with primary care physicians, working with PSWs to make sure that the care that was being provided in community. It is exactly, frankly, why we have enhanced the um, PSW and community care in our last provincial government, because we know how important it is to ensure that people who are able to stay in their own homes have that uh, surrounding care that is so important, whether it comes from um, professionals like PSWs Bonds. or indeed family and community members, and we'll continue to do that job. Thank you. Supplementary question. 
This is back to the Premier, and I hope, because I know he's had caregivers in his own family. I hope he listens to this part of the question. Long-term care in Ontario is failing. Home care in Ontario is failing. And those failings fall on the backs of our loved ones, our moms, our dads, our aunts, our uncles, our sons, our daughters. They make real sacrifices every day to take care of their family members who they love. Nova Scotia has a caregiver benefit in place right now. Prince Edward Island is creating a caregiver's benefit as we speak, and federal parties in Canada support a benefit as well. Premier, will you admit you are wrong? Make the right decision today and create a direct caregiver benefit here in Ontario to help those 3.3 million people who need one today. And again, I'll remind the members to make the comments through the chair. I recognize the member from Mississauga Centre and Parliament. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank that member for that question. That member cannot be farther remote from the truth. The long-term care sector in this province. I'm going to caution the member on her choice of words. Lower it. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, one can look no further than to our recent budget to show how much we are building long-term care in the province of Ontario. With our ambitious goal of 58,000 new and redeveloped beds and our 155 million commitment to the construction funding subsidy. We are listening to the operators across the province of Ontario. We are getting shovels in the ground in nearly every community in the province of Ontario. Who, after 15 years Order. of building next to zero long-term care beds, we are getting it done. The next question, the member for Richmond Hill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Associate Minister of Small Businesses. The Liberal carbon tax is one of the most harmful taxes this country has ever seen. It burdens families and small businesses and hinders economic growth and progress in our province. Speaker, we know the people of Ontario deserve better. This is why our government has been fighting the carbon tax tooth and nail since day one. But it seems that the Liberal members, under the leadership of the carbon tax queen, Bonnie Crombie, want to see this tax increased over time. They are propping up the federal buddies, tax grab agenda at the expense of Ontarians. We are not going to let that happen, Speaker. Question. Speaker, can the Associate Minister please explain why the Ontario small business owners want to see this tax abolished? The Associate Minister for Small Business. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the great member for raising this important issue. Speaker, just over a week ago, I joined my colleagues, the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs and the Minister of Colleges and Universities in Indiana for the Global Economic Summit. It was a great opportunity to once again meet with Governor Holcomb and many of the world's top economic and business minds. Each of us had an opportunity to highlight the measures our government has made to ensure Ontario is the jurisdiction to trade, to invest and to grow. Yep. From the UK to Australia, the EU to Peru, Premier Doug Ford and our government was being praised for creating the environment to attract and graduate the best talent needed for the jobs of today and tomorrow. The biggest hindrance for investment, Speaker, was the increased cost due to the federal carbon tax. There you go. So, Speaker, Response. just imagine how much more attractive Ontario would be if the opposition, NDP and Liberals, did what's right for their entrepreneurs and called on Ottawa to scrap the tax. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Associate Minister for the response. The carbon tax doesn't work for our partners to the south, and it's certainly not working for the people of Ontario. It is raising the price of everything and making life more difficult for the hardworking Ontarian entrepreneurs. Under the previous Liberal government, business in my riding of Richmond Hill saw the electricity prices skyrocket and people couldn't afford to power their homes. 
Now the independent liberals are supporting their friends in Ottawa as they carry on the mantle of costing Ontarians more. Speaker, can the Associate Minister please tell the House how the government delivers and support the entrepreneurs' Question. need as they continue to fight the job-killing carbon tax? The Associate Minister of Small Business. Speaker, my colleague from the riding of Richmond Hill is right to point out the devastating impacts we saw under the previous Liberal government with skyrocketing electricity prices and reduced consumer spending as people struggle to afford their basic needs. And now it is troubling to see the federal Liberals and their opposition allies like Taxalot Crombie continue to push this job killing regressive tax. Mr. Speaker, our government has been unwavering in our commitment to fighting this carbon tax and delivering the support our small businesses need. That's why we've taken concrete steps to provide relief and assistance to small business owners across Ontario. We've reduced red tape, lowered taxes and invested in programs that help entrepreneurs grow and thrive. Mr. Speaker, our message to the federal government and the opposition is clear. Scrap Response. the damaging carbon tax. Let Ontario small businesses focusing on what they do best. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question, Member for Oshawa. Thank you very much, Speaker, and my question is to the Premier. When a doctor tells you that you have to have surgery, you expect to have surgery, heal, and not worry about the bill. That's the health care that Ontarians deserve and expect, but that's not what happened for Teresa in Oshawa. She went to her doctor, got a referral, and had necessary surgery a few days ago at a cost of $3,600. This surgery should have been covered with her OHIP card, but she paid with her credit card. Minister, what is happening in Ontario that seniors are being asked to pay for doctor-ordered necessary surgery? Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. I'm happy to look into the individual case to make sure that all the facts are on the table. But I will say that as we expand access in Ontario, the NDP and the Liberal members continue to say they are happy and satisfied with the status quo. We're not, Speaker. We need to ensure that people have access in their community, in their hospitals, for diagnostic services, for surgeries. We are making those investments because we know as our population ages, as our population numbers continue to rise, we need to also make the investment in our health care system, and we're doing that with $50 billion in capital for hospital rebuilds, expansions, and new builds. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. Teresa is 85 years old, and she's trying to stay healthy. She followed her doctor's advice. Surgery is stressful enough on its own. It should not cause financial stress, too. Teresa is on a fixed income. Her pension doesn't leave room for $3,600 surprises. And she told us, quote, I've got a money tree here, and it hasn't got any money on it. I would like this to be covered. If not for me, then I hope this gets fixed for the next person who needs it, end quote. Minister, can you reassure Teresa and other Ontarians facing necessary OHIP covered surgery that they won't have to pay out of pocket for their health care? Minister of Health. As I said, Speaker, I'm happy to look into the specific cases to ensure that all the facts are on the table. But I will also remind the member opposite that we have a system in the province of Ontario that ensures when patients believe they have been improperly charged. They, will, um, they can initiate an investigation that the Ministry of Health initiates, starts, and ultimately, if appropriate, refunds the patient. But again, you know, this member talks about status quo and how they're satisfied with what we have right now. We are not satisfied with the status quo. We need to ensure that we continue to expand access. And yes, that includes 50 Order. new capital builds. It also includes expanding access to surgeries in community so that people don't have to travel for hundreds of miles to get to the surgeries that they just so desperately Response. need. We'll continue to expand MRIs. We'll continue to ensure and fund CT scanners because we know those are the pathways to ensure the people of Ontario get access to health care in their communities. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Peterborough, Kawartha. 
Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Just like every other Ontarian across the province, rural residents are feeling the financial pressures created by the federal carbon tax. They experience unique challenges as they have to travel further and for longer to go anywhere. They face higher costs across the board compared to urban regions. And Speaker, in my riding alone in Apsley, when Sayers Food Town burnt, people had to travel 40, 50 kilometers to get groceries in either Lakefield, Buckhorn, or Bancroft because there was no other option in Apsley. Unfortunately, these are the challenges the Bonnie Crombie's Liberals and their federal buddies can't and won't understand. Our government understands that scrapping the carbon tax is the right thing to do for Ontarians who are struggling, and will continue to call on the federal government to end this tax. Speaker, can the minister please explain how the carbon tax disproportionately affects rural Ontarians and their quality of life? Good question. Good. Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the, the question from the member from Peterborough because he lives it every day, as do I in my rural riding. You know, it doesn't matter whether it's from fuel to food, the cost for rural life is going through the roof because, unfortunately, Bonnie Crombie and Justin Trudeau have never met a tax they didn't like. And, you know, it's affecting everything in rural Ontario, from getting to work to getting our students to school on our rural school bus transit ways and even down to driving seniors to their daycare programs through to Meals on Wheels. This horrible Liberal carbon tax is causing the cost of everything to go through the roof, and therefore it's jeopardizing the pillars of community that we need in rural Ontario. Ladies and gentlemen, we all need to stand together Response. and implore all Liberals, backed up by the NDP, to scrap the tax. Thank you very much. That, con that concludes our question period for this morning.